With so many popular programming languages out there, it's easy to confine yourself to the bubble that encompasses your favorite language. So I've compiled a list of what I feel are the most useful programming language constructs from different languages. In this video, we'll go over those constructs and why they're useful. Some languages have what are known as first-class functions. In JavaScript, for example, functions can be assigned to variables, passed around as arguments, and returned from other functions, making them first-class citizens. So we can create a function that takes in a function as an argument, and from the top-level function, we can call the function that was passed in. Now, sticking with the previous example, a function that operates on other functions, like this top-level function is doing to the passed-in function, is called a higher-order function. And that's pretty much all there is to say about higher-order functions. But there is more to be said about functions. Let's define an individual function to double a number x and another individual function to square a number x. We can then define a function to compose two functions f and g together, which will return a function that calls one on top of the other with the number x being passed into the innermost function. We can then assign the resulting function of composing the two functions together to a variable. That variable now contains a function that will call one function on top of the other. And when we call that function, we'd first call the inner function and its result will be passed into the outer function, which will output the result of the functions applied in sequence. In some languages, like Haskell, you can define a data type, like shape for example, with multiple constructors. In this case, a constructor for a circle and a constructor for a rectangle. Now, the parameters that define one shape might be different from the parameters that define another shape. For example, a circle would have one parameter which is its radius, which in this case would be a float. But a rectangle would have two parameters, those being its width and height, which we'll also define as floats. Now here's where the magic happens. Let's say we wanted to write a function to get the area of a given shape, but as you know, the formulas for calculating the area of a circle and calculating the area of a rectangle are different. Or maybe you're like me and you were held back in the fifth grade. Either's fine. Regardless, instead of needing to write two separate functions per se, we can write one function that we'll call area, which takes in a shape that we can destructure based on its constructors. Remember, circle and rectangle are constructors for the shape type. So in the case of circle r, r being radius, r is bound to the float parameter defined in the circle constructor. Which means that in the function body for circle, we can use the radius that was determined when defining the circle in the formula to calculate area that is specific to a shape that is a circle. And the same thing in the case of a rectangle. So when the area function is called, the pattern will be matched, in this case the pattern being the shape constructor, and whichever pattern is matched is the function body that will execute. Now, the programming language Rust has a similar construct for pattern matching, but in Rust's case, we can make use of enums. But not just any enum. In Rust, we can associate data with each enum variant. So we'll define an enum for shape with two elements, circle and rectangle. And then we'll create a function for area pretty similar to the way we did it in Haskell, with the main difference being the match keyword in Rust, which will match based on the pattern, which is in this case the enum variant.
Now, there are quite a few programming languages that incorporate the construct known as a list comprehension. But this time around, we'll focus specifically on Python. Basically, a list comprehension enables us to take something like this and compress it into something like this. And both would produce the same resulting list. That's pretty straightforward, right? So I found that the most useful way to make use of this is to combine it with another construct and that construct is called generator expressions. So as it stands now, this list comprehension will store a full list of values in memory which the name S refers to. But what if there's a use case where we don't need to have a full list created in memory? What if we only need to iterate over the elements one at a time? Well, that's where generator expressions can be useful. The syntax is simple. A generator expression always needs to be directly inside a set of parentheses. So if you want a named variable to refer to a generator expression, you would wrap the expression in parentheses like so. You can also pass it into a function that takes an iterable, like the sum function for example. But we'll come back to that in a bit. When we assign a generator expression to a variable, instead of storing the entire resulting list from the list comprehension in memory, what happens is each value is generated one at a time when needed. We can then make use of that value somehow and then it's discarded essentially. And if we were to call next on the generator, we'd get the next value. This means that we can write some pretty memory efficient code. So going back to the sum example, let's say we want to get the sum of the list produced by the original list comprehension. As mentioned before, first we'd need to create this list in memory. Then sum would iterate over each value and add it to the sum that we'd eventually print. But if we use a generator expression, we don't need to store that list in memory. Sum can just iterate over each value which is generated on the fly. Until eventually the generator reaches the end, at which point it would inform the caller, the sum function in this case, of a stop iteration. Which is just a fancy way of saying that the generator no longer has any values to generate. For this last one, we're going to take a look at the Kotlin programming language. String interpolation allows us to embed expressions within string literals. And I think that Kotlin is one of the languages that has an elegant way of handling this, and since it is a language feature that gets used a lot, I'd say there's substantial value in that. And that's going to be it for what I think are the most useful programming language constructs. If you like this video, don't forget to leave a like, and if you're interested in more content like this, don't forget to subscribe. And of course, if you think I've missed any very useful constructs in this video, feel free to post them in the comment section, and if there are enough, maybe I'll create another video. But anyways, I'll see you in the next one.